so that means sort of their technical and philosophical implications. So what I do, I uh, do protocol design means mostly. Uh, I take scientific research and try to make usable protocols for them. Um, and this track is called Medium as Message. It's, it's all about exploring technical and philosophical implications of the tools we use. So I'm going to talk about the sort of implications of protocol design. Um, and I'm looking at protocols more as like an abstract thing and not so much as an uh, like actual implementation of one single protocol. And the name of the talk is uh, inspired by a great book by Alexander Galloway, which is called uh, Protocol Our Control Exists After Decentralization. So there's one first uh, technical aspect of whenever you want to try to build any sort of like open system, you most likely not want to get around like building a protocol. Um, if you want any sort of you know, uh, like, uh, interoperable system. Like can, it can be done ad hoc, which is sort of the Bitcoin way, where the protocol is the code that is written in Bitcoin D. Uh, can be very explicit by a, a protocol specification. And of course, there can be discrepancies between uh, spec and implementation. And then there's the social aspect of the systems we're building sort of produce communities, that produce organizations. And so it's very much an important topic to take care of. Uh, when you try to build a protocol, also sort of think of, okay, what sort of like systems does this enable to build? And also, more importantly, what sort of accidents uh, does this new protocol enable? For example, uh, um, like you build a nice state channel protocol, and all of a sudden, uh, they're like it's widely successful, all of a sudden there are much, much less um, transactions on chain, minus of much, oh, much less uh, transaction fees, and they might start behaving differently. So, so it's much worse. And protocols are on every layer of um, what you're trying to build on an application layer, you want to build an ordering service, you probably want to need a protocol. You want to build a blockchain, of course, you want to build a you want to build like an off chain market maker, you probably want to need a protocol as well. So, you're right, right. Um, but what, where does protocol even come from? I think most people um, that I've asked, which are not, not technical, when I've I, I, I asked them, like, what is a protocol, they have this notion of, oh, it's just like a recording of things that happened in the meeting, which is also sort of like the earliest thing which, uh, in like ancient Greek, where the word sort of first came from. And then later it sort of became this um, very like more diplomatic thing where in diplomacy you have like sheets of protocols and things like that which like, uh, try to sort of give a social framework to human interaction if you will. And this, this quote here is sort of really nice because it, it, it describes very well what the protocol is on a social layer but like the same thing applies for technical layers as well. So the protocol is on an end uh, in itself, rather it's a means by which people of all cultures can re relate to each other. It allows them the freedom of concentrating their contributions to society, both personal and professional. The protocol is, in effect, the frame of the picture rather than the content of it. Which says a lot of like, uh, um, like, it basically it provides you service instead of like describing the actual contents of what's going on. Um, the, the, the sort of thing that then protocols do is like they sort of facilitate net network building. Um, so protocols provide the conditions under which networks can be formed, uh, and thus they also shape sort of networks that can be built. So it's, um, what even is like, what in protocol, um, the protocols sort of provide black box services. They're um, instances, like implementations of a service. Um, and services, like everybody knows, for example, if you want to um, call someone voice call. There's lots of, this is one service, and there's lots of different protocols and implementations. You can voice call via line line, you can voice call via voice call IP, you form whatever. Different protocols, but the same, but the service is the same. 
and the service is so to so, sort of define externally visible behavior and protocols are then the sort of black box implementations of this this behavior. Um, so let's get a bit more relevant to the sort of blockchain content and let's talk okay, what kind of like what sort of protocols we have. And these are sort of in order of um, like first appearance, first we have communication protocols on the early internet and we have cryptographic protocols and then in the end we have now crypto economic protocols. Um, the, the interesting thing is that as you move from um, left to right, you sort of start uh, internalizing much more of the external, uh, externalities of sort of implementing these things uh, in communication protocols. All you assume is it's just is a, is a lossy channel, they are not really adversaries, everything is nice, you're sort of in, uh, in a closed network or like the early internet where there are no more no adversaries. Then cryptographic protocols all of a sudden have this notion of an adversary who wants to, um, I don't know, uh, interrupt your connection, they want to maybe um, eavesdrop, things like that. And then crypto, uh, crypto economic protocols they sort of add like the, I guess, economic dimension to of people okay, they have actually monetary incentives or monetary uh, motivations. And what, what sort of actors do we have in our protocols? We have uh, altruistic rational Byzantine actors. Altruistic actors, they are more than happy to follow any sort of protocol, even if it means losing like tiny amount of money or whatever, or um, basically, yeah, that's it. the rational actors are the ones who try to sort of be selfish in the sense that they want to have the best, but they still adhere to the protocol. And then we have Byzantine actors who, are, who can basically do anything. They're willing to lose money. They will lose money to attack the chain. They will, um, I don't know, try to, um, yeah, just it's here. So let's get some mechanism that we have in communication protocols, which is, um, like I said, the, the nice and easy world where everything is good. The most famous example, which is still in use today, is probably BGP, which is sort of the, the protocol um, which controls peering all of the internet. Basically, without PGP, the internet doesn't work at the moment. And PGP sort of is a nice and happy place where everybody just assumes everybody is good. There's no sort of cryptographic, at least not yet, cryptographic uh, or even economic incentives to run BGP nodes to keep them secure to uh, announce all of the other things. Um, and then these are sort of like sequence controls, like making sure units arrive in a sequence. For example, um, by numbering, error control, like if there's a loss of channel, you want error correction, whatever. Then you come to cryptographic protocols, which come in lots of different flavors. Um, but it generally just means any, pro any kind of protocol that considers adversary, which might be like a Byzantine um, consensus, that Byzantine for control consensus protocol. But it might also be um, any sort of protocol using authentication and provide privacy, such as HTTPS, for example. Um, and not all the things that are listed here are on the same level. Like accumulators might use hashing and signature schemes might be zero non proofs and whatever. And just to give up some examples. Um, and then the crypto economics pro uh, protocols, the interesting thing is that all of a sudden it becomes possible to punish, or well, economically punish anyway, um, uh, participants in your protocol if they don't um, adhere to the rules of the protocol. Which is really interesting. It wasn't really possible before. For example, in proof of stake, the lead election, like if somebody misbehaves, double signs, then you might slash their stake. And it also gives you like access to a big array of all of a sudden like mechanism design, like auction markets and things like that. You can incentivize people to behave rationally and to sort of lead to a quote unquote desired outcome, whatever that outcome might be. And it just makes, in general, like behaving not according to the protocol much, much more expensive. This is also sort of a nice thing to, for security. So, but the problem is that when you wrote the, the um, quote from a great book, which is on, on architecture, 
like some architectural element. Uh, when you build a thing, you kind of really build that thing in isolation, but you uh, must also repair the world around it and within it, so that the later world, that one place becomes more coherent and more whole. And the thing is that uh, the thing which you make takes its place in the world of nature to make it. So this is sort of the, the things where things are getting messy because you cannot, even if you want to, build protocols in isolation, unfortunately. Take for example, um, like, if, like the, the current hype, which is DeFi applications. Um, all of a sudden, the miners have a very high incentive to, for example, in Ethereum, to mess with the, the ordering of transactions. Let's say you have an Oracle transaction coming in that updates your price feed, and you try to trade something. Um, you try to trade on a DEX, on the side, and they change. All of a sudden, the miner has a pretty nice incentive to. Um, like process DEX transactions before the Oracle transactions, for example, things like that. Um, or take, for example, in the MakerDAO, you have a debt position, the price changes rapidly, you try to top off your, your uh, CDP, basically, and all of a sudden, the miner has a very, like, sort of high incentive to get bribes, and you say, okay, if you don't bribe me, I'm not going to let you top you off your CDP, which is sort of, Problem, which uh, not many people have addressed it. Um, and then there's also like all oh, problems of like front running transactional reliance, which is this is um, one of the more recent papers by Fudai, who gave a talk yesterday on something similar, which is basically uh, exactly what that of like in, in the context of mining, where all of a sudden people realize that miners, if you build like any sort of protocol on top of the miners, they have a very high incentive to extract more value than they get from fees or from transaction rewards. Which basically, um, yeah, because basically the, the, the protocols which are on a high level assume that their lower level is ideal. Which is sort of also like what happened last year with like the side channels that have the CPUs for all of a sudden. People realize how oh, there are more things on the CPU does that our program does not um, know how to deal with because there was some sort of quote, like abstraction in between, which in the end did not have spoiled, did leak into the higher layers. And then there's also the one of the biggest problems, which is nobody has really addressed it, which is bribery, um, especially in uh, proof of stake sort of pro uh, protocols that would be very interesting to see, how using different chains to bribe people in other chains will be used, uh, would be really very interesting. So but, um, let's see, like, let's say you have an uh, idea for a service, you come up with a protocol, um, then there's question marks and then there's some other implementation. Um, the process like, of like, writing a protocol is very much similar to just normal software design, meaning it's highly iterative, it's very messy. Um, you have often inconsistencies between the implementations and the specification of the writing. Um, and lots of bugs, there's with the software I only found after implementing them and then you sort of get to this mess, okay, am I going to update the code or am I going to update the specifications? Um, especially if everything like this happens in the open, there's an abduction where people start like actually using these things that becomes even more complicated and it's often, quite often, protocols end up being used in situations that were never designed for, which makes things even worse. Um, so, some sort of like, I guess, guidelines for just the design and the model is always simplicity. If there's more than one way to do something, then it's most likely wrong. Um, exceptions make everything more error prone because you sort of uh, like th basically force you to unwind a lot of state and you end up in like quite often in uh, undefined states, which is a mess. And easy features are the features most people will use. So if you have so, some sort of like um, complicated features, it will most likely not be used, it will not be tested properly, and you will only catch bugs very, very late in the life cycle of this protocol, if at all. Um, which is then making easy things easy. The misuse resistance is in general like a thing for cryptographic protocols, 
for length, not to if you write a hash function, you shouldn't, but or if you do, and uh, or and on the hash function, sorry, a signature uh, algorithm like dealing with nonsense is and yeah, so try to make things that you doing misuse resistance, like no real defaults, no automatic deleting of some sort of like data, 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 whatever. Uh, make everything as explicit as you can. Because people will not read the full specifications. They will assume things based on what they've read. And which just leads to a lot of problems and be very transparent about the facts that the things that you're trying to say have. Um, another interesting thing, which is not really what, not really a thing yet in the, like many like blockchain protocols, but it's like think about depreciation, like what would it look like if all of a sudden everybody decided, okay, uh, this blockchain system is now outdated, let's move into a new one, which is sort of happening with 1.0 to 2.0, but um, it's a usually a very ad hoc pro uh, progress uh, process and there's not, it's usually not a thing people think about a lot because of course when you're designing a protocol you want it to be used in models indefinitely. And then minimization, putting things on chain, costs lots of money, uh, leaking data is also not nice. And uh, yeah. So when you actually try to write a specification, like the thing that people are supposed to read, don't try to be clever. Please don't. Uh, repeat words if needed, because otherwise people might think they're different things. If you're just trying to be uh, not uh, repetitive in the way you write. State diagrams are amazing. Um, if something looks complicated as a state diagram, it's probably too complicated and people will get confused. Um, and the nice thing with like sort of the state diagram representation is also that you, it's sort of easier to formalize. And I mean in the end this sort of the, the, the thing that you need to take care of is like good balance between formalism and abstraction. Ideally if you in an ideal world you could write like a formal specification of a protocol and have it implemented automatically, like put into code, that would be amazing. But unfortunately um, writing formal specifications is really, really hard. Tools are getting better, but it's still a pain and like trying to actually write a formal like definition of all the things that you for example want to include in a um, in a consensus algorithm is not impossible. So too much formalism makes it much harder to read and implement for people. So that you have to some sort of like strike some sort of balance between formalism and abstraction. And probably the most important thing is uh, if it's easy to misunderstand something, then it's a bug in the spec. Otherwise, you just might not going to be happy, and people will misunderstand you. Um, yeah, this is the biggest kind of words. It's like what happens once people use this thing. What what happens once it's deployed? How do you upgrade things? And people will not upgrade. How do you deal with like backwards compatibility? Um, this is really really hard, especially uh, if everything of this like happens in the open. And you basically have people just as soon as you write something, people using start using this um, very messy, and yeah, it becomes especially in like decentralized system or trying to be decentralized systems, it gets even worse. Not just technically, but also politically, which uh, we've seen uh, quite often in the film itself. So to wrap up with some more uh, like philosophical notes then uh, network searches can have important consequences for distribution of power in uh, composition of deliberate currents. They do not produce a flat or fragmented uh, world of diffuse power relations and ready corporations, nor do they tend to become less asymmetric over time. Instead, they result in specific tangible and enduring corporation of power imbalance. Meaning that if your protocol um, ends up being used or ends up trying to sort of incentivize people for any sort of uh, like quote unquote rational behavior, 
you sort of need to think about what is the like, long-term like, play out of this behavior. Things are very sticky. If people are can extract more information somewhere else, they will. And you might end up, even if you have good intentions, you quite often might, might end up just making things worse and or just trying like, not including people who or let's say you know people have but actors who might be disadvantaged already, just make them more disadvantaged. And that's the end. Thank you.